Welcome to this new edition of the interview. Our guest today is Nicolas Burns, Under Secretary of State, one of the deputy of uh, Condoleezza Rice. He's a highly regarded diplomat. Uh, he's an expert on Russia and Europe. Hello. Nice to see you. Uh, Nicolas Burns, there is uh, today in the world a rather worrisome situation. We see Russia coming back. And uh, many times Vladimir Putin as being saying no to the Americans or to the Europeans on Kosovo or Iran or other matters. Uh, are you preoccupied yourself? Uh, some people talk even of a new Cold War, uh, but do you see that this way, uh, is there a possibility or risk of confrontation with Russia? How would you analyze the situation today in the world? Well, I think we have to be calm about this situation and, and reflect on, on where we have been in the past and where we should be in the future. There's no reason to return to some kind of era of confrontation or a new Cold War with Russia. Russia is so much integrated now economically and politically with Europe, with the United States in a way that was never apparent before with the Soviet Union that I think it would be very difficult for us or for the Russians to even choose such a policy. And I also think that it's not the one that we want to see. We have a balance of interest with Russia. We're working very well with them on the question of Iran to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear weapons power. We're working well with Russia on North Korea. We have many problems with them. We believe that Russia, there's a declining uh, commitment to democratization inside Russia. We have some problems with the way Russia treats some of its neighboring countries. So what but does we Vladimir need to Putin find need, wants when he says, for example, when he compares American diplomacy to the one of the Third Reich? Well, I think, I think we need to find a balance of interest with Russia. We need to be calm. We need to be stable. And if the Russian leadership is saying outrageous things in public, we shouldn't have to respond every time. And I think that's the more sophisticated, uh, successful policy line that will lead us into a, in a more positive direction in the future. But I think we'll have to live with a situation where there'll be times when we can work with Russia and times where we have to, be, have to disagree. One of those times is, is now in Kosovo. Exactly. Uh, so what will happen if, uh, as Vladimir Putin says, he will support the Serbs? We know the Serbs will not surrender Kosovo. We know that Russia might uh, put his veto uh, at the UN. So if there is a veto at the UN, uh, does it mean the process will stop about Kosovo and the future independence? No, the process is not going to stop. First of all, uh, we are going to, we will we'll continue our efforts at the United Nations to try to pass a resolution that would support the Atasari plan, which of course is to create an ind a supervised independence for Kosovo. We'll continue that effort. And I think that Kosovo is going to find its way towards independence because 95% of the people are Kosovo are Albanian. Most of the Serbs have left. They've waited eight years for this moment. They've been very responsible in the way they've led their country. And the vast majority of countries in Europe and North America, where I live, are supporting this. And so I think it's inevitable that we'll get to Kosovo, uh, an independent Kosovo. President Bush said the other day he would like that to happen as soon as possible, and that's what we're, we're, we're trying to accomplish. What does that mean, as soon as possible? This year, uh, Kosovo will be independent? Well, certainly this year. I think we, we, may, as we may have to go through a certain period of time of debate in the United Nations in New York. We might see some renewed efforts to have uh, discussions between the parties. That would be positive if that happened. But we certainly want to see Kosovo become independent uh, in the coming months. And we'll, we're working very well with the European allies on this. I was here in Paris to have a meeting with Britain and France and Germany and Italy, with the EU and NATO. And we had a very positive meeting. We're working all together in the same direction. Mr. Bush is impatient. I think President Bush understands that the people of Kosovo are impatient. Milosevic attacked, attacked Kosovo in 1998 and 1999. He drove a million people from their homes. It was one of the worst acts of aggression in Europe since the Nazis. They have now been living for eight years under the tutelage of the United Nations. They want to know what their future is. They want to be able to assume responsibility for that future. So I think President Bush is speaking to the deeply felt desires of the people of Kosovo. He's also acting to support what's right, and that would be a peaceful, uh, path to independence for the people of Kosovo. You mentioned Iran. Uh, Iran is still going on with this uh, nuclear process of uh, um, uranium, and uh, they do not stop uh, this work. Uh, are you in favor of new sanction against Iran, and what will you do if the Russians don't want that? We were hoping that Iran would accept our, our, our offer to negotiate, the offer made by France, Britain, Germany, the United States, Russia, and China. 
It appears that, that uh, Iran might reject that offer. Should it do so in the coming weeks, we will, of course, with our allies and with Russia and China, and push, there, yes? push for a third Chapter 7 sanctions resolution in New York at the, at the United Nations. And the military option is still on the table, but you would prefer to solve this uh, conflict with diplomacy, right? We are on a diplomatic path, and the President and Secretary of State have been very clear about that. We're trying to use diplomacy to resolve this very difficult problem of Iran. We've been very patient. We've been working two years now, two and a half, with the European countries to see if we can create a dynamic that would lead to negotiations. Iran continues to say no mm -hmm. to negotiations. If it does finally say no in the next week or two to Monsieur Solana, then I think it's inevitable we'll go towards sanctions. And sanctions will not be just punitive for punitive sake, but they're meant to try to influence the debate in Iran to encourage the Iranians to know, to think that they need to negotiate with us, not follow a policy of confrontation. No American president should take uh, any options off the table. The president has not taken a military option off the table, but we are clearly focused on diplomacy. And you think the Russians will follow the Americans on that? Well, I, don't, I think the Russians are working well with the Americans and the French. We've been working well together for many years now, and we believe the Russians have the same interests that we do. To see a, an Iran that takes advantage of civil nuclear power for electricity, but not have access to the sensitive parts of the fuel cycle, or certainly not have access to nuclear weapons. Uh, what about the uh, project of the U.S. missile shield in Europe, in uh, Poland and uh, the Czech Republic? Uh, here, there also, the Russians are saying no, and they even propose a, a new project in Azerbaijan. Is it a diversion? We don't, I don't think so. You know, for many, many months, the, the Russian government spokesmen were saying there is no need for missile defense. And then President Putin said last week, let's build a missile defense system mm -hmm. in Azerbaijan. So it appears we're seeing an evolution in Russian thinking. They now appear to, th appear to be saying that they, they see a need for missile defense and uh, will investigate the technical possibilities, as the president said, of working in Azerbaijan. But we are confirmed that we shall continue to work in Poland and the Czech Republic. And we're, we're pleased that the Russian government is now saying that there is a need for missile defense. So your vision of this uh, shield would be that there would be some installation in Poland, in Czech Republic, and in Azerbaijan altogether? Well, I, we haven't committed to Azerbaijan yet because we have to look at the technical question of whether the facilities there can be integrated successfully with the new facilities that we intend to build and whether or not the government of Azerbaijan would be agreeable to this. So that has to be, uh, that has to be uh, looked at that particular question, but we are confirmed in our judgment that it's, it's a very important initiative to have to look into the possibilities for missile defense in Europe so that we might keep Europe more peaceful in the future. You are uh, here in Paris and you talked with the French uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs Bernard Kouchner about Darfur and we just heard that there is now an agreement from Sudan to authorize a joint force of the UN and uh, the United of Africa nation to have a, a new force of uh, around 25, 30,000 soldiers to try to uh, protect the people there. Uh, is it a step in the right direction? Is it enough? And is it possible uh, in the next few months to see this force on the ground? Well, I hope that this will lead to a better situation and one where there's clarity on what we can do to help save the people of Darfur. But I think the Sudanese government has been saying over the last 24 hours that it would not permit, permit any non-African troops to come into a United Nations and African Union Peace Corps. That's a very difficult position to take, a very inflexible position to take. You know, United Nations peacekeeping forces are generally made up of soldiers from all around the world, from each continent of the world. And so it, it would not be right to limit the participation just to African troops, although they ought to play, they ought to be the backbone of this force. They shouldn't be the sole representatives in this force. So are we seeing really a, a good solution and is it uh, thanks to the effort of China or what happened? Why is this solution now? Well we hope we can see progress in, in Darfur and we hope this could be a good solution but we're not sure yet. We'll have to see if the Sudanese government is actually willing to carry out its agreements and whether it will permit non-African troops to participate because it doesn't make any sense to have a peace, an international peacekeeping force from the United Nations that would exclude countries from all over the world. It just doesn't make much sense. And so we need to ask further questions of the Sudanese government and ask for further flexibility from it. Uh, what about the French-American relationship? Are we uh, turning a new page uh, since the election of Nicolas Sarkozy? And how would you qualify today the new relationship between the two countries? I think the relationship is excellent. We see 
eye to eye on most of the world's great problems. We are working together very closely. We are aligned together on the Middle East peace negotiations, on Iran, on Darfur, on Afghanistan, on Kosovo. I think that we've been doing well with France for a number of years. Uh, President Chirac uh, and President Bush were able to work together after 2005, particularly on the question of Lebanon and Iran. I think with President Sarkozy and Foreign Minister Kushner, we're seeing a new dynamism, a new energy, a very positive attitude towards the relationship with the United States. We welcome that. We return that warmth. Uh, I've had two excellent days here in Paris of very, very good discussions. And there is still cooperation ahead in Afghanistan. Oh, I think there's no question. France is a member of the NATO force there, as, uh, as is the United States. We're working together. France has decided to even reinforce the French contingent. And so this is very positive, and uh, I think we'll work well together in Afghanistan. And maybe uh, the French wait a little bit more from George Bush on climate uh, control. And But you've heard more from President Bush on climate change. He has new ideas. He presented them. We hope to have a meeting uh, this year in the United States to establish a new way of working, a way that will include India and China, which is critical if we're to have a worldwide solution to the problem of climate change. It's a very important problem. We certainly understand that. We want to do our part to um, help the rest of the world cope with this problem, reduce the negative impacts from it. Um, and, and that's why the President stepped forward last week and suggested that there be a meeting in the United States in 2007 to kick off, if you will, a new era of cooperation on climate change. What about the image and America's place in the world? America is the strongest country in the world, and at the same time, uh, a big survey showed uh, recently that uh, people believe that today, if there was a crisis, the reaction of China will be more credible than the one of the United States. So what should be done to restore America's place in the world? We Americans and Europeans had a, a major disagreement, obviously. Many of us, not all of us, about the Iraq war. I, li I was living in Europe when the Iraq war began. I saw it in Belgium and across Europe. But I think that we've begun to come together in the last year or two and work more closely together on, on the great challenges of the day. And I think that slowly public opinion should turn in a more favorable direction as some of these negative impacts, the demonstrations, the arguments that occurred during the Iraq war begin to fade. That's particularly true here in Europe and also, of course, in the Arab world where the conflict uh, has taken place in Iraq. But I want to accentuate the fact that um, I think the United States, it's a big, we're a big country. We are, um, our presence is all around the world, diplomatically and economically. I think it's too much to generalize to say that somehow there's some common global problem. I think it's more regional, and uh, I think there's much that we can do to cope with that and to show that we are respectful of our friends and neighbors, want to work with them, want to build up the United Nations and the other multilateral institutions that are so important to the future of the world. So it's a problem. It's something we think about in Washington, but it's one that is, um, is more specific than general. Uh, as we look around the world. Well, thank you very much, Nicolas Burns. It was the last word, and thank we'll you. see you soon for another interview on France 24. Thank you.